Would you stand for the reading of God's Word today? We are in Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to live together in unity. It's like the precious oil on the head running down upon the beard as on Aaron's beard, the oil which ran down upon the edges of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon coming down the mountains of Zion, for the Lord commanded the blessing there, life forever. Let us pray. Mighty God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning, Lord, as we continue to worship in the word. Just let your Holy Spirit bring the message that we need to hear today. Lord, take the words I'm about to say and transform them into the words that we need to hear as your people. Lord, that your kingdom would be glorified, that you would be lifted high, and Lord, that we would be filled with your presence here on this earth. In Jesus' holy name, amen. You may be seated. So Psalm 133 is actually the 14th Song of Ascents. There were 15 that were written. This one, uh, King David wrote three, and so this is one uh, that he actually wrote. And the Songs of Ascent, if you're not familiar with, during the three religious celebrations uh, at, in Jerusalem, as the pilgrims made their way to Jerusalem to celebrate, they would sing these songs as they began the this, this steep incline headed into the city. And you could almost picture the scene that it's, a, it's this celebration of, of a long journey. They're tired, they're wore out, but they're starting to go up into the city. And then all of a sudden they begin to sing this very familiar, very joyous song because it was about the family of God coming back together and engaging in worship of God together. And it's very fitting today that this being Membership Sunday, that this scripture text fits so well as we welcome home to St. James some new members today. Now, if we were to look in the Bible, we would have to agree that family disunity is pretty prevalent in the Bible, right? Uh, From the earliest family, Cain and Abel, remember the story? Angry, rock, dead, right? (laughs) Lot and Abram had their differences as they began to grow and, and prosper in life. We know that Miriam and Aaron, they, they struggled with Moses from time to time. We look at Joseph and his brothers, they sold him into slavery. Family disunity is biblical in our history, right? Yet we know that this song, the song of ascent, is a call for the family of faith to be in unity, to come together. Now, you can take two cats and you can tie their tails together And you can throw them over a clothesline. Are they united? Yes. Are they in unity? No, they're not in unity. They're going to fight. They're going to claw. They're going to scratch at everything they they have, right? That's that's the idea that, that some churches have about what unity looks like. The idea that we're ascending into Jerusalem as a family unit, as we're coming together, gives us this great idea that we need to operate as believers, as the family of God. And we know that in our individual families, there's a lot of things that our family teaches us, right? Our family teaches us about love, teaches us what love looks like, how we engage with each other, how our relationships develop. We know that um, our family dynamics teach us our morals. They teach us right from wrong. They set the boundaries for us. Uh, When you have a young kid and they begin to do something that they're not supposed to do, you stop them. You say, no, don't do that. That'll hurt you. And you love them enough to protect them in the midst of that. Our families also teach us about life. They teach us how life is going to play out and what that looks like and how to navigate those. Are there any parents in the room that your kids still don't call for advice? (laughs) That's not fair. (laughs) Jerome says, "Ah, our kids don't call for advice. They can't talk. Okay, all right. (laughs) Older parents, right? It's a fact of life. We we use our families to help guide us and direct us and put us in in good positions. Um, Our families can also teach us a few other things. Sometimes they can teach us resentment, right? Sometimes our families can teach us abuse or sometimes even destructive behavior, Our families have a great influence in our lives, and so to look at this from a spiritual perspective, I want to read what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10. Now I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you may be complete in the same mind and in the same 
judgment. Now, as a family of believers, we're going to have disagreements, aren't we? Where someone's going to believe it should be done this way, someone's going to believe it should be done that way. Probably some of the greatest arguments I've seen in church life have to do with the color of carpet in the sanctuary. It's unfortunate, but that's the reality of it. That creates tension when we have disagreements. What we have to understand is that families disagree, but families also love each other. And just because we have a disagreement as a family of God doesn't mean that we can't lean into and love each other. One of the things that happens in families is they reconcile, sometimes longer than others, but sometimes that takes place where an argument has happened and reconciliation begins to take place. We know that families, in the midst of that, they begin to heal, and they begin to move forward as a family unit. Now, what Paul's talking about in the divisions, he's talking about the Greek word schisma, which we get our word schism from, and schisma or schism means to a split or a gap. So, I don't know about you, but there was one point in my childhood where I was so angry at my parents, I was going to run away. And I packed a bag, and I walked out the back door, and I forgot something, so I went back in. <laughs> and I didn't walk back out. So there are times in our families where, where, we, where we want to break away, we want to, to leave, we want to split away from them, but Paul's asking us not to do that. He says there's just disagreements. We need to be of one mind. We do not need a schism for the church. When the church is walking in unity, which is the, the plea of our text today, it's what the pilgrims would sing as they were they're ascending into Jerusalem. It's like the precious oil, as the text says, on the head running down upon the beard, on Aaron's beard, and the oil that which ran down upon the edges of his robe. Now, this is an, uh, this is an allusion to, it uh, takes us back to Exodus, the 30th chapter, where uh, God gives Moses this idea of how to anoint the priest. And they would literally pour oil down upon them. You know, today we anoint people, we put a little oil on our hands and we, we put a little cross on their forehead or we lay hands on them. But in the Old Testament, for the priests, they would literally dump oil on them and it would run down throughout them. And then when they would go out into the city and they would bump into people, they would smell that oil and they would know that this is the, the anointed high priest. And so a couple months ago, whenever I was preaching with you guys before I got to be your preacher, um, I preached on the royal priesthood. And I preached on the idea that every believer is a royal priest, part of the royal priesthood. You are a priest, each and every one of you. And for us, it is not anointing oil that we're anointed with. We are anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. We are, we are, the Holy Spirit pours into us as believers, and that's the anointing that we have. When the church walks in unity, it's like the Holy Spirit running from the tips of our head all the way down to the tips of our toes. Just the Holy Spirit permeating everything that goes on in your life. The Holy Spirit just enveloping who you are and what you are. You see, it is only through the power of the Holy Spirit that a church can walk in unity. The, the world tells us there's ways that we need to live. The world tells us there's things that we need to do. The world tells us, gives us all these self-help books to help us be in unity together. But we don't need that. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to draw the church together. You see, the world would tell us that gossip might be a spiritual gift. That's not godly, is it? Gossip's not of God. That's not a spiritual gift that we have, but the world would tell us that's how we need to be. We need to spread things. We need to tell little lies. We need to, we need to separate people. You see, that's the enemy. The enemy coming in and separating the church from each other, breaking up the unity that the church has. We need to lean into the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit lead us into all unity. Verse 3 of Psalm 133, it's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion, for the Lord commanded the blessing there, life forevermore. Now, I know it's been hot the last couple of days, yes? Did anybody wake up the other morning and it was 60 degrees outside? Let me see it. You late sleepers would never know. <clears throat> It was beautiful. I woke up and I, I was coming to church. I'd showered and I stepped out and, and, and all across the grass was dew. 
I mean, as far as the eye could see, you couldn't touch grass without touching dew. And that's what it's like when the Holy Spirit pours out on the church. It is this covering that goes from every aspect to every aspect. It's like the dew spread out across a lawn. And that's what we as a church need. We need the Holy Spirit to come in and pour out on the church, not just this room. Sometimes we think about that. This is the worship space. This is where the Holy Spirit should be present. We want the Holy Spirit to permeate every nook and cranny of this church. We want every Sunday school class to be permeated with the Holy Spirit. We want every uh, youth room, every children's ministry room permeating with the Holy Spirit. We want the Holy Spirit to, to wash through every closet in this church custodian's closet. Every single place we step, we want the Holy Spirit, the dew of the Lord to be present for us so that we can walk in the unity that Christ has called us to walk in. Today, as we begin to welcome home our new members to this body, I think it is so appropriate for us to talk about what our membership covenant is is and what it means to be a member of this church. Those of you that are members, you took this covenant at some point in in our history. There are five pillars of of our covenant that we take together, and that is our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. We're going to break those down in just a second. But some years ago, about 20 years ago, give or take, uh, the denomination which we don't speak of began to see great decline And they thought the number one thing to do is to have our people witness so other people will join the church and our numbers will increase. Not witness so that people will know Jesus and the kingdom will grow. They can't understand why decline continued even after they added witness as part of our membership covenant. My best way to explain what our covenant looks like and how important each aspect is, is that's a, if you've, my grandma had an old slat bucket, wood slat bucket, right? And there were slats that went vertical up and down all the way around it, and it held tight. Anybody ever seen one of those or had one? Yeah, very good. <clears throat> and they would seal them so tight together that the water wouldn't seep. It would just set in there. But if one of those slats halfway down the bucket was broken, how full could you fill the bucket? Halfway full to the slat, and then it's going to pour out. And I say that about our membership covenant together. These five areas, each one is as vitally important as the next. And if one of those areas is weak in your life, then the others will suffer because of that. Our membership covenant is so important, and they must, all these must work together for the kingdom of God. Prayer is the first one. I talked about prayer a little bit last week, so I'm not going to dive too much into that. But prayer is the DNA of this church. It is who we are as a church. Did you know the prayer chapel just over here at a diagonal is the center of this facility? It was built that way, created that way, so that prayer would be known as the foundation of what we build upon. We have uh, the prayer uh, healing rooms that take place where people pray over people that need healing. Did you know Monday through Friday we have daily prayers in this sanctuary? Right over here by the fireplace, 7.30 in the morning. If you're not aware, you need to come. Life-changing prayer is taking place here in this sanctuary. 7.30, Monday through Friday. Just pick a day, show up, call the boss. Hey, I'm going to be late today. It's for a good cause. <laughs> on Saturdays, we join down here at the front of the sanctuary. We pray over this church. We pray over its members. We pray for the kingdom to come. We pray that the Spirit would move through our church like never before. Prayer is so powerful. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. That is so important to pray without ceasing. And sometimes that's weird for us because we're like, well, how do you pray? I don't want to be driving my car and close my eyes. You don't close your eyes when you're praying all the time. There's a season for that. But praying to God means that you're in such a relationship with God that there's this conversation that's going on the whole time. I'm having a conversation when I preach. 
I'm saying, Lord, don't let me say anything stupid. And God's saying, you got this. And we're having this dialogue that goes back and forth. The, the Holy Spirit gives me words occasionally to, to shift the focus of the sermon. It is a constant dialogue that we have to be in. I don't have it all figured out, but I know God wants me to be in a constant communion with him. What happens whenever we are in a relationship with someone and we don't talk to them? That's not a relationship, is it? Verse 18 of the Thessalonian text, And everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We have to make prayer such a strong foundation of who we are and who this church is. Thank God it is. Once we do that, things will begin to smooth out. When chaos erupts, that relationship with God is so tight, that communication line is so, so in tune, that peace, God's peace, will enter your, your heart. Our second membership covenant is presence. We were created to be in community. You were created to worship in community. It drives me crazy whenever I hear people say, well, I don't do organized church anymore. You know, I worship God alone, just me and God. That's not biblical. It's not healthy. It is not healthy. What do you think is going to happen when we get to heaven? The, the angels are going to be singing and praising God, and the saints are going to be singing and praising God, and you're going to be off in a corner by yourself? No, you're going to be swept up into corporate worship of God. And that's how we should be in our life together. We were created for community. We were created to live together. The hardest thing about church that I've found is that people walk in on Sunday morning, they say hi, they worship, they say bye, and they go on their merry way until next Sunday. That's not what God intended for us to be. God intended for the believers to be in community together. Look back at the early church, Acts 2, 46 through 47. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Do you want to know why that equation works? Because it's relationship. It's not, it's not just knowing scripture. It's not just, it's relationship. You know, I, I wholeheartedly believe that that is the greatest tool to a church's success is small group engagement where you're plugged in outside of Sunday morning. If you're just coming here for a feast on Sunday and going back out into the world, you're missing the most important part of your spiritual growth. I also have an expectation as a pastor, I hope you, I didn't tell the search committee this, but sorry. <laughs> you don't tell people everything, you want to, right? I'm in now, so I can tell you. I actually have an expectation that church members will participate in small groups. Whether that's Sunday school class, whether that's a Bible study in your home with other believers. There's an expectation that you're going to grow in your faith like I'm going to grow in my faith. None of us are there yet, friends. And you guys have some spiritual giants in this church. Amen? That are carrying the load. And then we've got some people on milk who are just learning about Jesus and how to be a disciple. And everybody in between, I fall somewhere about right here, I think. That spiritual giant isn't done growing, <laughs> just as the person on milk is not done growing. It is a journey that we take together. It's a journey where we foster and we nurture our relationship with God and with each other, and growth takes place with that. Those early church small group meetings, those gatherings, were intentional about sharing life together. Oftentimes when you see someone do something horrific, or maybe they even take their own life, there's this idea that everyone around them had no clue. Didn't see it coming. Happiest person in the world, I don't understand it. 
Friends, it's because we're not in relationship with each other. We should know each other so well that when your life changes, your mood changes, something's not right, we should identify that and out of love step in and intervene. It's about glorifying God and it's about building each other up. The third <clears throat> pillar or membership covenant is, is gifts. It's tithing. It's giving to the Lord with a joyful heart. I'm uh, reminded of two guys who were, their plane went down in the South Pacific and they got stranded on a deserted island and uh, they made their way to this island together, just the two of them, and one guy was panicked. He was just stressed beyond belief. He's chopping wood. He's trying to find ways to create firewood to, to set a search fire up so if a plane went by, they could grab their attention. He wrote uh, SOS in the sand real big so that they could see that if they flew over, they would know where they are. The other guy was taking a nap under a tree, and it made the panic guy mad. He was like, what are you doing? We're stranded. We're lost at sea. This is not good. And the guy says, it'll be fine. Just relax. So the panic guy went back to preparations. He's counting coconuts to see how long they have to live, trying to do all the math. But the other guy still just relaxed, sitting there. And so the panic guy finally says, look, dude, what is your problem? We're, we're going to die out here. He says, relax. I make $10,000 a month. The guy's like, are you serious? 10,000, what's that have to do with anything? You can't access your money out here. You can't buy us food. There's nothing that you can do for $10,000 a month. And the guy says, relax. I make $10,000 a month. I tithe. My pastor will find us. <laughs> it's good to joke about money, isn't it? I'm reminded of the widow's might, the woman who gave such a little amount, but it was so much for her. Mark, the 12th chapter, she walks up and she casts her coin in. It's about her heart. She was sincere. It wasn't about duty. It was about love of God. When we were in India, we saw this, um, we went to a house worship and it was packed wall to wall, people in this, this little house worshiping God. And uh, it came time for our offering and this is the actual altar from that, uh, that moment. Uh, I love the picture of the little kids sitting down there looking at it. Uh, but when they did offering, the people brought their offerings up and I was struck in that moment of what they were bringing. They were bringing rice um, and vegetables from their gardens and things of that nature. And one lady in particular really stuck out to me. She had a small bag that might have had a cup, two at the most, of rice in it. And you could just see the love in her eyes as she brought that offering and laid it on this table. And it hit me. That's 10%. Here's someone who loves God and is giving 10%. What does her family have to live on the rest of the time? The pastor would then take up those gifts, those offerings, and he would distribute them to people who needed it more. It's about the heart. She loved God so much she wanted to help brothers and sisters. She wanted to share generosity. You see, generosity is a heart issue. Matthew, the 19th chapter, we're reminded of the rich young ruler, right? Jesus, I've been good, followed all the rules, done all the things I'm supposed to. How do I get into heaven? What Jesus tell him? Go sell. Go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Then come follow me. And we know that the rich young ruler went away with a broken heart, right? Downtrodden. He was sad. Now for Jesus, it wasn't about the money. It had nothing to do with the money. It had to do with the heart. Was he willing, willing to give? in abundance was his heart in the right place. You can follow all the rules you want. You can do, check all the boxes you want to. If your heart is not generous, it's an issue with you. You see, generos generosity is the core of this church. I have witnessed it. And if you haven't, you simply got to step back a minute and watch 
I watch needs arise and I watch the abundance that people give to those needs and they fulfill them. Gifts, generosity of the heart. Our fourth vow is service. 1 Peter 4, 7 through 10. To end of all of the things, <clears throat> the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be of sound judgment, sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. Above all, keep fervent in your love for one another because love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaint as each one has received a special gift. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter says, pray. We talked about how important that is. He says, love. Again, loving someone doesn't mean you have to like their attitudes, actions, or behaviors. Love one another. He said, be hospitable and use your gifts to serve one another. You see, God has given each and every person here and listening online special gifts that only come from the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not something that you can figure out on your own or, or, or do on your own or acquire on your own. You can't take a test and study how to do it better. They are supernatural, spirit-imposed gifts given to you. And the purpose of those gifts is to build up the church to glorify God and grow the kingdom. The only, the only problem is, is people have these gifts and they don't use them. They sit on them or they hide them. You're hurting the kingdom. You're hurting the growth of the kingdom. I almost picture it like this. Imagine if you had your kids ready, you wrapped all of their Christmas gifts, you set them out, and Christmas morning they wake up, they run into the room, and they grab the gifts, they look at them, they set them to the side and never open them and go on about life. Is that how God's heart feels whenever we're given these gifts to use and we choose not to? He has gifted you to serve others. I love verse 9 of that text. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. We like to complain, don't we? Feels good sometimes just to get it off your chest, doesn't it? I've taken mission teams to the Philippines numerous times, to Mexico, all around the United States. And there's always a complainer on a mission trip, isn't there? Yes. If you did, haven't seen one, you've been on a mission trip, it's probably you. Um, <clears throat> there's always someone. It's too hot. This doesn't work. This isn't right. This, oh, my gosh. Are we there yet? There's always someone. It's in our DNA. It's, it's in our human nature. We just like to complain sometimes. But Peter's telling us, be hospitable to one another without complaint. We should be using our gifts to serve each other. We should be building the kingdom here and now. And the fifth and final vow is our witness. You see, being a Christ follower compels us to be a Christ sharer. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are a Christ sharer. The Great Commission said, go and tell. It didn't say, sit and wait. And we're guilty of that. We sit in church on a Sunday morning and we wait for people to show up, to join. We, we hope they will show up and join. Jesus said, go and tell, not sit and wait. The greatest church growth I've ever seen was a small church we served, had 45 people, give or take, and in two years we grew to 80. Every time I saw a new face, every time I engaged someone that was visiting, I would introduce myself, welcome them, and they'd say, I'd say, hey, how'd you find out about our church? And they'd say, well, Frank DeShazo invited me. Person after person, Frank DeShazo invited me. I don't know if you've seen the statistics, but people don't come to church when a preacher asks them to come to church. They come to church when a friend or an acquaintance invites them. But this guy had this habit of doing that. And they would tell, often tell a story, something, you know, do, do you know Frank? No, I was at the gas pump pumping gas on Thursday, and F Frank was there getting gas, and he started telling me about how great his church was and how excited he was about where God was leading the church. And, and so I thought I'd come give it a try. Frank DeShazo, fill in your name. What if kingdom growth was because of you? And you see, everyone's story is different. Everyone's story. Your story is different from my story. You heard my testimony last week. Your, your story is different than my story. I'm reminded of uh, 
youth group trips that we would take, and you'd take him to a conference or somewhere or camp, and there'd be a dynamic speaker, and he would talk about how he was addicted to cocaine, and then God saved him, and he put the cocaine away, and everything was great, and you load the kids up in the bus, and you hear one kid mumble, wish I was addicted to cocaine. <laughs> no, you don't. That's not your story. These kids need to hear the story. I grew up in church. I was faithful. I felt God's presence from an early time. I don't know. I just one day woke up and Jesus, I knew Jesus loved me and I loved Jesus. And I asked him into my heart to be in a relationship with him. That story is just as important as the cocaine story. You see, because there's someone in your life that needs to hear your testimony and your witness so that they'll say yes to Jesus too. Everyone's story is special to someone. The culture's made the popular phrase, teach the gospel and if necessary, use words. That is a feel-good saying for people who don't want to live out their responsibility of sharing their testimony. Yes, when we have Christ in our life, there are going to be some attributes that take place in our life. The Holy Spirit's going to begin to push out the sinfulness in our life. The Holy Spirit's going to begin to purge the evil stuff in our life. And we're going to start living a life that starts to reflect the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5. Right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness. Thank you. When we walk with the Holy Spirit, it pushes the world out. And those fruits begin to develop and people begin to see those fruits in us. If you think being a jerk is a spiritual gift, I've got news for you. It's not. That is not of God. The Holy Spirit manifests the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Jesus didn't say, therefore go and act like me and others will know. He said, go and tell the gospel message and the kingdom will grow. Maybe to make that a little easier, I know that the number one fear of people sharing their faith is rejection. No one likes to be rejected. I was on pins and needles for the vote. Nobody likes to be rejected. It hurts us, doesn't it? It hurts our ego. It hurts who we are. But I'm going to give you a little secret about sharing your testimony. You don't save anyone. It drives me crazy when I hear, how many people have you saved? None. God is in the business of saving people. What we do is we make an introduction. Let me tell you my testimony, my story. And then it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict and convert. And the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit does. Statistics say somewhere, it takes somewhere around close to 18 times for someone to hear about the gospel message before they say yes to Jesus. So you're number six. Who cares? Share it anyhow. Get them one step closer to accepting Christ. Maybe you will be number 18, and that's a great moment. But don't let number 18 be your number one goal. Plant the seed. Someone else will water it and let it grow to fruition in God's timing. We simply make the introduction, and the Holy Spirit does the rest. Prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness. Those are our membership vows to this church. We will support it through those five things. The stronger you make your weakest one, the stronger the others will become in your walk with Christ. I'm fixing to pray here in just a minute, and we do have a good group of people who are going to join us today. We've had a great celebration in the last two services, and we want that to continue here. But I'm going to, if I didn't scare you off with the membership vows, (laughs) there's an expectation of being a part of the church. It's a high calling to live into that. So I'm going to ask you as a church who are already members when we get to the point to recommit to your membership vows as well. To support this church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness for God's glory so that the kingdom 
will grow. Let me pray over us. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to lean into what it means to be a family, to lean into what it means to be a member of the family of God. Lord, as we prepare to step into that, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to continue to move amongst us. Move us in your direction. Help us to be a people focused on you, not just ourselves. Let the world see the light of Christ through this church. In Jesus' name, amen.